please feel free to review, subscribe, follow and share the Outsider Art Podcast. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Outsider Art Podcast, Episode 5, Martin Ramirez, Part 1. First things first, let's get some of the myths about Martin Ramirez straight. He wasn't mute. At the time of his committal, he was very likely not severely mentally ill. And the Freudian interpretation of a sexualized meaning to his many drawings of trains and tunnels is highly likely to be erroneous and, in the cold light of meaningful biography, wildly out of context. In the 10 years prior to and the 50 years following his death, aged 68, on February 17, 1963, the interpretation of the life and work of Martin Ramirez was plagued by a combination of biographical holes and a difficulty within the art establishment to find a way to speak about his uncommon art. His oeuvre, of which there are approximately 450 known works, has often been interpreted through a grubby lens, and the mythologizing of a slight, mute, insane Mexican immigrant incarcerated within the California psychiatric system for over 30 years has taken on a life of its own. Thankfully, and due in no small part to the work of dedicated scholars, dealers and curators, the fog that has surrounded Martin Ramirez has begun to clear, and we are now able to view his remarkable art with a more enlightened eye. The most common image of Martin Ramirez, and one that will likely be familiar to those who know his work, is of a gaunt, dark-haired man with downcast eyes suspiciously eyeing the camera, wearing a dressing gown, holding up one side of a large artwork that features graphically bold animals balanced on patterned half-spheres. Also posed on a half-sphere is a jinete, or horseman, holding a pistol and mounted on a horse. Surrounding the figures are strange mollusk or fingerprint shapes of undulating lines. The other side of the artwork is held by a well-dressed man with salt and pepper hair who is looking intently at the work. This well-dressed man is Tamo Pasto, who in the early 1950s as a professor at Sacramento State College discovered, in inverted commas, the enigmatic work of Martin Ramirez, and who went on to not only encourage and champion his art, but who also became the unintentional primary source of the minimal and distortable biography that coloured interpretation of Ramirez's work for the following several decades. There is another photograph of Ramirez that was taken at the DeWitt State Hospital in 1952, which is perhaps a couple of years prior to the photo described. It shows the same man in a formal portrait, dressed in a shirt and tie, with hair combed back and beaming at the camera. Ramirez looks, to the casual observer, like any other middle-aged man of his time, a little rough around the edges maybe, who might choose one day to knock off early from work and get a nice photo taken at a local studio. This is not a well-known photo of Martin Ramirez. The difference between the two photos, I think, encapsulates the Martin Ramirez of myth and, in the light of new information and detail about his life, the Ramirez of a more well-examined history, which offers up a more nuanced way to view and appreciate his undoubtedly stunning art. Martin Ramirez lived his life in two halves, in two very different halves at that. The first half spent in a small rural community in the state of Jalisco in the tumultuous first years of the 20th century, following the life pathway of a typical but somewhat upwardly mobile poor Criollo Mexican. The second half of his life was spent in El Norte, first as an immigrant worker, then for the last 32 years of his life as a patient in the state of California's mental institutions. That the first half of his life inexorably shaped the masterful artistic output achieved in the second half is something that has only fairly recently been able to be understood and assessed. 
In the first episode of the Outsider Art podcast, I discussed how biographical emphasis played a problematic but necessary role in the discussion of outsider art. The case of Martin Ramirez is a prime example, however, of how biography is still a vital factor in giving viewers a better understanding of the nuances of an artist's work. The limited biographical information surrounding Ramirez that scholars, curators, critics and viewers dealt with for decades has been filled in and expanded to now allow us to reassess his work anew. It is thanks to the dedicated work of Victor and Christine Espinoza that we have a much richer biography of Ramirez with which to do this exploration, and it is this work that I will be drawing on to outline Ramirez's life story. I would encourage you, if you are interested to dive in further, to get hold of Victor M. Espinoza's book entitled Martin Ramirez, Framing His Life and Art, and do check out the episode page at shows.acast.com slash outsider-art-podcast for a reading list. Espinoza and Espinoza sum up the prevailing attitude to Ramirez in their chapter in the book Martin Ramirez, which accompanied the American Folk Art Museum's 2007 retrospective exhibition. Quote, Despite recent interest in the lives and motivations of such non-canonized self-taught artists such as Henry Darger, and Adolf Wolfley, as well as the increasing recognition of Martin Ramirez's work, little attention has been paid to the details of Ramirez's life, although it was undoubtedly the circumstances of his migration, his institutionalization, and his separation from his family and his culture that motivated the specifics of his artistic production. It is as if Ramirez's marginal position in society was somehow enough to explain the schizophrenic tendencies supposedly manifest in his art. For many years, critics and curators have drawn upon the few pieces of information about Ramirez's life that were provided by Tamo Pasto. For these reasons, even the most basic of our underlying assumptions about Ramirez's life, and perhaps even his art, were tainted with the prejudices and assumptions of a single interlocutor. End quote. I'm going to apologise in advance for mispronouncing some of the Spanish names and place names in the following section. Martín Ramírez González was born January 30, 1895, in Rinchón de Valaques, a small rural community in the west-central Mexican state of Jalisco, to Gertrudis Ramírez and Juana González. Los Altos de Jalisco the Haliscan Highlands, is in the eastern part of the state and is characterised by a cultural predominance of Criollo population that hearkened more to its Spanish roots than to any pre-Hispanic indigenous ancestry. Ramirez's family was devoutly Catholic, clearly evidenced by the fact of Martin being taken by his father to San Francisco de Assis to be baptised on the day following his birth. His name, as was customary, was that of the saint whose date in the Catholic calendar corresponded with his birth date, Saint Martina. He was the youngest in a family of eight children, and despite not attending school and the family's poor origins, his father was a sharecropper, Ramirez was not completely illiterate, as his father was able to read and write and acted as a teacher to the children of the local community. Ramirez attended Mass every weekend and two of the most identifiable churches in his work are Santuario del Señor de la Misericordia in Tepatitlan, his local town, and the small parish Capilla de Milpillas, where he married his wife, Maria Santa Ana Navarro Velázquez, in 1918. This parish still preserves an oil painting and small statue of La Purissima, Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception, which are undoubtedly the inspiration for Ramirez's many Madonnas. Following his marriage, Martin and Maria Santa Ana moved to the municipality of Totolan, 12 miles south of his birthplace, 
where he worked as a sharecropper and journeyman labourer at various rancherias. They lived in this area, moving between different rancherias for five years, during which time Maria Santa Ana gave birth to three daughters, Juana, Teofila and Augustina. In 1923, having saved some money, the family returned to the Los Altos region and bought a small piece of land on credit. There they worked the land, which was about 50 acres, and raised livestock including sheep, pigs, two deer and a cow. Espinosa and Espinosa explain the kind of man that Ramirez was in that time. Quote, Besides its deep Catholicism, Ramirez's world was dominated by a ranchero culture, strongly patriarchal and characterized by a stubborn individualism. In the Ramirez's drawings, there are many references to this rural society, which, since colonial times, had been devoted to cattle ranching and seasonal agriculture. According to Guadalupe Villa, a neighbour who, at age 16, had worked for Ramirez's family milking cows, Ramirez was un hombre de a caballo, a man of the horse, who carried a pistol. The horse and the pistol were two very important symbols of masculinity and social status amongst the rural poor of the ranchero society. Villa also confirmed that Ramirez had a passion for, and indeed an expertise in horses, which frequently appear in his drawings. End quote. In 1925, Ramirez did what many in his community had done since the beginning of the 20th century, and increasingly since the onset of the Mexican Revolution in 1910. He migrated to America. His choice was one of economic circumstance as he saw that the only way to pay off the debt owed on his land was to work temporarily in the U.S. So, on August 24th, 1925, he left his family and his rancho in the charge of his brother, Atanasio, and made his way to an electric plant construction site near Tepatitlan in order to earn the money to pay for the train trip to the border. And in early September... 1925, Ramirez crossed into El Paso, Texas. His plan was to work for long enough to earn the money to pay down his debt and to be able to productively work his land. However, he would never see his family or his country of birth again. Once in the US, he made his way to Northern California, where, according to his family, he worked for the Southern Pacific Railroad and later in the mines a wholly hellish occupation by all accounts. For five years he periodically sent money back to his family, at times including small drawings on the margins and the backs of his letters. In early 1926, Ramirez's only son, Candelario, was born. It is not known whether he was aware that Maria Santa Ana was pregnant before he left, but this must have made his time in the US even more difficult than it already was. Further destabilizing would have been the news of the Cristero Rebellion, which began in 1926. This civil war pitted the secular government and the Catholic population, and Ramirez's devoutly Catholic home state bore much of the brunt of the conflict. His land, animals and possessions were gone, and even more disturbingly, due to misunderstanding one of his brother's letters, Ramirez falsely believed that his wife had joined the Federal Army to fight against the Cristeros. In the face of this, he set his mind to never return to Mexico. The rebellion ended in 1929, the same year of the Wall Street crash, and in 1930, the Promised Land saw the beginning of the Great Depression. During this time, many Mexican immigrants, and even those who looked Mexican, were either voluntarily or forcefully deported from the U.S. Ramirez, however, refused to return, and while there was no information on how he survived, he was still in the California area when he was picked up by police on January 9, 1931, and subsequently committed to Stockton State Hospital, diagnosed with firstly manic depression, and then later with dementia precox, catatonic form. Victor M. Espinosa summarizes the conditions under which Ramirez was committed in his book Martin Ramirez, Framing His Life and Art. 
quote. The eugenic tendency to associate immigrants with psychiatric illness or mental inferiority influenced the entire process that led to the commitment of Ramirez and thousands of immigrants to state hospitals. The incarceration of, quote, undesirable individuals, such as newly arrived single men, was used as a form of social control. Migrants were more likely to be labelled mentally ill because of their strange appearance, lack of language skills and cultural habits. In those years, commitment to a state hospital followed four steps. Detention, diagnosis, recommendation to a court and a formal commitment by the court. Two court-appointed medical examiners spent a few minutes with the accused, listened to the accounts of witnesses and produced an affidavit of insanity that included their recommendation to the Superior Court judge. After a warrant on the charge of insanity was issued and the accused was taken by police to a detention hospital or jail, it was almost certain that the accused would end up in a psychiatric institution. Ramirez's experience was most likely similar to those of many other immigrants of the early 20th century. End quote. Whether Ramirez was insane or not at the time of his committal, circumstance and societal mores destined him to spend the rest of his life institutionalized within California's mental hospital system. Trapped within the system, and a system that was regarded as one of the worst hellholes in the country, it is little wonder that as a Spanish-speaking immigrant, his mental health would have suffered inexorably. In 1934, his medical notes stated that he refused to speak. However, he was not a mute, and there are times over the following years when he chose to speak in his native language. Ramirez escaped from Stockton several times, and was either arrested and returned, or returned dirty and hungry of his own volition. In the mid-1930s, Ramirez began to draw, and his medical notes showed that his work was held in some regard by staff. Unfortunately, despite some of his work being sent to his family from Stockton, there are no identifiable drawings dated prior to his transfer to DeWitt State Hospital in 1948. It was at DeWitt that Professor of Art and Psychology at Sacramento State College, Tamo Pasto, first came into contact with Ramirez's work. There appear to be two stories told about Pasto's first encounter with Ramirez's art. Either he saw it hanging on a screen door in the hospital solarium, or during a lecture he gave at the hospital, Ramirez slipped him some of his drawings. Either way, it was a fortuitous moment as Pasto, having recognised Ramirez's artistic abilities, not only helped provide drawing materials, but also asked the hospital to date and preserve his drawings so that he could do a study on artistic creation and madness. It was a turning point in Ramirez's life and led to his most productive period during the 50s. And it is here on this somewhat upbeat note that we shall leave part one of Martin Ramirez. Next time we will look at his life as an artist and explore an oeuvre that comes back time and time again to themes that his more illuminated biography has helped to put into much sharper relief. There will be a reading list available on the episode page at shows.acast.com slash outsider-art-podcast. Please join me again soon for Martin Ramirez Part 2. And feel free to review, subscribe, follow and share the Outsider Art Podcast. It would really help the podcast to grow. And apologies again for all the mispronunciation of Spanish. Thank you.